I am honoured to present uh, Ahmad Izam Omar, CEO of Primework Studio, media exec, writer. He wrote the movie Pulang, which uh, some of us saw in Langkawi. Uh, producer, arranger, songwriter, musician, etc., etc., etc. Right? It's up. Good afternoon. Um, how do you top that? That was amazing stuff. I've been schooled. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for those who come last night. I'm just going to do a little recap, but it's more along the lines of talking about lessons in influencing the collective brain, which is where I'm coming from. And I'm coming from the uh, insights from my own journey in music, TV, film, and beyond. I'm going to start right out by just putting it out there, okay? You do not represent Malaysia. And I'm talking to the Malaysians in this room. Of course, obviously, those are not Malaysians. You do not represent Malaysia, but <laughs> Malaysians in this room, I always say that you do not represent Malaysia. You may think you do, but you actually don't because we actually live in ivory towers. We, 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 we you know, live in nice houses, get into our nice cars, go to our nice office, go back to the car, go back to the, you know, towers, go to the golf club. We totally miss out on 99.5% of the Malaysians out there. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm going to share with you some information which actually is considered a little bit confidential. So, please do not take any pictures, which I'm sure by saying that you all will take pictures. This is the top 20 programs on TV across all channels in Malaysia for the first half of the year, done by Nielsen, uh, Nielsen, which you know is a ratings agency. Now take a look at the shows. If you can see, uh, they purposely made small, so you can't take really cool pictures of it. Uh, if you can see, first one is Anugra Jora Lagu, song competition, reaches 6.3 million people. The share is 55.7%, meaning at any one point of that night, 55% of Malaysians watching TV was watching Anuraj Yaro Lagu. Okay, number two, Lieutenant Zana with Jana Nick, right? Reach 4.3 million people, share 41.7%. Number three, Pujaan Hati Kanda. Yeah, the, you laugh at all these drama scenes, right? But I guess what? 49.5% of people watching TV was watching it. 4.2 million reach, right? Uh, okay, anyway, uh, who here has watched Nortu? Hands up. Okay, four people, great. Cinderella. Oh, this is, oh no, not Cinderella. How about this? Um, Cinta Non Grata, number 16. Anybody? No? Right? Uh, Gang Van Janaza, number seven. <laughs> Janaza is a funeral van. <laughs> oh, one. Okay, I'm going to ask a question that uh, Dato Isham would love to ask. How many here watch CNN? Okay. Wow, a third of the room. CNN, I hope there's no CNN people here, <laughs> do not make the top 600. Okay, if there's a reach of 6.3 million for Anagura Juralagu, CNN does not make four figures. That's all I've got to say. So basically, what we're trying to say is that um, we uh, do not represent Malaysia. Now, I know you're going to say, you don't represent Malaysia, but some of you here will probably be very emotional and go, and go like, but Izam, you're wrong. Nielsen is wrong. Everyone watches the shows I watch. Well, in my experience, everyone is usually three people. <laughs> three people WhatsApp you and then you WhatsApp me. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> you, your neighbor, and two friends in the masjid. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I never knew of this, any of this before. If I did, I wouldn't have taken the risk I did all these years ago when I started in the music. Now, some of you might know from last night that I, I started a company called Positive Tone, where we did some sort of really crazy music, and we had to be really different than everybody else. Mainly because, and this was a hit last night, <laughs> that the record industry was a bit different in the 90s, and it was filled with a certain kind of music which was a mix of the Scorpions and Malay ballads. Rock kapak lah, basically, right? And most of the sounds, 99% of the sounds, sound like this, right? 
Come on, everybody. You can sing. One, two, three, four. Okay. How we get you back here? Okay. Okay, so anyway. But the record industry at that time, 90s, were made up of three distinct categories, right? Malay songs, Chinese songs, and international English songs. So everything was divided into these three major ones. Are we in the background? Okay, TV, radio, press were divided just like this. The retailers were divided just like that. Even the record companies were divided exactly the same way. So what we did was we did some research and we realized that this was not right. The industry was missing something maybe. So we jumped into the mosh pit and the mosh pit's collective brain. What is a mosh pit? This is a mosh pit. So, yeah, part of my job last time was jumping up and down with them, right? And ladies and gentlemen, this is what your kids are up to when they tell you they're at college. <laughs> Not at college, they're at my gig, right? So what the collective brain was just telling us is that the infrastructure is wrong. These young kids, this underground swell was saying that the, the industry is wrong. Maybe the industry didn't see it, or maybe the industry chose not to see it because it kind of disrupts their business model, right? Because they have to figure out something new now. So what we did at Positive Tone was that we released all manners of music that was different than the typical music at the time. Hip-hop, alternative, um, um, well, uh, R&B, you guys know Innuendo, um, basically all sorts of weird stuff. And we became the monopoly of urban music in Malaysia. So it was, it was a pretty good time for us. And nobody else was doing what we were doing, so we were basically monopolizing the whole thing. Um, but what this was is... Uh, hang on, sorry. Okay, what we, what we did was actually, we saw the triangle of Malaysian demographics in this way. We saw them divided into very straightforward Malay, Chinese, Indian Dalai Lain Lain. Okay, sorry about the Dalai Lain Lain. Uh, Dalai Lain Lain to the foreign guest means and the others. All right. So because of urbanization of Malaysia in the 60s and 70s, there live a bunch of kids who grew up being very, very urban. And they listened to the same stuff, the same music, had the same taste. And some of you probably is in this room. And we call these guys the urban guys. So, there's urban and there's mass. So we at Positive Tone targeted urban, a target audience, because we felt the urban guys were aspirational, meaning that if you make urban and progressive music, it will filter down to the mass market, right? Ur tastes do not regress. Tastes always move forward. You try something new, you don't want to go back to the old stuff. So we thought if you do something new, then basically we could infect the entire mass market with it, which we actually did. So we made all the artists that was new, considered progressive, we pushed them down the, uh, the, the pipeline, and they became a mass market. And this is how we kind of influenced the collective brain at that time. And this is what we did when we launched 8TV. Same thing, we used the same uh, uh, method, coming up with free TV that people have never seen before, uh, totally changed the way TV uh, was for the urban youth. Uh, you know, some of you have seen these shows before, right? So, uh, and then, with ATV, it was just not like a marketing stunt. It actually made money. We actually broke even as well. It's, we used the same thing when we launched radios, Hot FM and Fly FM, which I talked about also last night. And we also did the same thing when we launched the region's first ever video streaming portal. We launched this in 2010, even before the iPad was launched. In fact, the iPad was launched about six months later, and we were struggling trying to figure out how to format this for the iPad. There was, why, were we, why were we so ahead? Because of this drama, this drama called Nor Kase. Now, Tonton was launched in 2010, the video streaming portal, and now it's got 8 million registered users, so it's, it's, it's pretty good. But Nor Kase was launched in 2009 on TV. Now, when Nor Kase happened, there was no Netflix or iFlix or any other flixes that you can put this on to watch, and everybody watched TV at a certain time. But what we found out was Norkasi became a big runaway hit on TV3 at that time. And everybody wanted to watch Norkasi also, but they couldn't, we couldn't increase our ratings because, you know, physically some people cannot watch at that time because they were busy, you know, cooking or praying or doing something, right? So we thought, okay, why not we put Norkasi 
on the TV3 website, which we had at tv3.com.my website. So we put it on the TV3 website, and we were amazed by the shift of how people started viewing uh, uh, um, this drama series, which before this, there was no online viewing. In came tv3.com.my, we put this online, and we had amazingly 64 million video views online. This is 2010, thanks. 2009, sorry. Now, there's not even 64 million people in the country, so I have no idea how we got to this thing, right? But then uh, we realized also one thing that, I should say this, a lot of the views came during lunchtime, and a heck of, <laughs> and a, heck of a lot of views came from Putrajaya. <laughs> so, hmm, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> So we keep, we keep pushing the boundaries. Now we push the boundaries of animation thanks to the great grass from NDAC. Together with us, we, we invested in animation, Malaysian animation that we can be really, really proud of. I'm so, I'm so chuffed yesterday because Ronnie liked the show. So I'm like, hey, Ronnie likes it. <laughs> Come on, Pixar. <laughs> All right, anyway, so Agent Ali, the movie is coming out. Um, and we also push the boundaries in this particular movie called Pulang, which is... Um, push the boundaries of cinematography, push the boundaries of story, because it's not a typical story that the Malaysian audiences want. As you know, Malaysian audiences, the mass market loves horror or comedy. And best of all, horror comedy, right? But not this. This is not horror comedy. There was no ghost that came out from the ship and stuff. You know, it's straight up heavy drama about a guy in the 40s who wanted to make a, a better life for his, you know, he's, he's from a fishing village, want to make a better life for his beloved wife, so he jumped on the merchant ship like all Malays did last time, jumped on the merchant ship, traveled around the world, promised to come back, but he never did. His wife only found out what happened to him 61 years later. Now, this was based from a guy, uh, I just realized, this guy is from Malacca, and i just uh, so sad to say, Saida, that the shots in Malacca were shot in Trenganu. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> We couldn't find a nice beach, you know, it was all fire, but why is all this mangrove, la? you know, so we all <laughs> went to Trenganu, of which we have to shoot the sunset during the sunrise, because it was on the other side of the thing, right, so, <laughs> it's, it's a bit, yeah, but anyway, so it, uh, it got, it, the, it intrigued Netflix so much that it became Malaysia's first ever Netflix original film, so that was really great. <laughs> so you can watch it on Netflix. Uh, so, but here are the important, important conclusion, I guess, for the lessons in influencing the collective brain. So I'd like to share with you three points, I think, that maybe could be applied to, um, in any industry, hopefully. The first one is, if you want to move the brain or influence the brain of a community, whatever you're doing, your product, it cannot be a job. It's got to be a mission. Right? It, it's got to be why we're doing it and not what we do, actually. Right? And the, the end game is amassing a fortune and making lots of money, right? right? No, actually, it's not. It's not, you capitalists. Uh, <laughs> the end game is doing something of significance. Or the perception that you're doing something of significance. Right? <laughs> That's how you get people to buy what you're doing and go with the, yeah, let's change Malaysia or whatever it is that you're doing, right? Now, so it's not a product. It's got to be a movement. It's got to be an anthem of a generation. It's got to be anthem. It's got to be something that generations go like, yeah, we love this anthem. For example, when I did Positive Tone in, in late 90s and early 2000s, the artists, I mean, all these great artists that you know of, it's not their hit songs. It's the fact that they were doing something that was you know, re represented the generation. So it's beyond hit songs, it's anthems already. Also, when we launched ATV, we did something that was just represented the youth. Even when Tonton came and we changed the behavior of people watching online, right? And even this one, which I did not do, right? This is Disney. But remember Frozen? You remember the kids singing the song, Let It Go? Right? Everybody was singing it, right? You, you have to remind yourself, they are singing it to their parents. <laughs> freedom. I want freedom for you. Stop, stop helicopter muttering me, you know what I mean? I want to please let, you know, let, you know, let me go. Let her go. Let it go. 
So that became a very strong battle cry, and it became an anthem, right? So an, an idea is great. Most of us here really grow an idea. And if, if we're in an ideal thing, we have an ideal product, it's even, even superb. But if you have an ideology, right, and an anthem, you kind of change the world. Like, like, like Star Wars, I'm a Star Wars geek, that's why I say Star Wars. Do you know that Star Wars, there was a survey did in the 90s where people in England and Wales were supposed to note down what religion you were? And the fourth most famous religion is Jediism. <laughs> There's even a Jedi uh, church in Maryland. Oh, these guys are crazy. But imagine if your brand or whatever you do becomes a religion. It's like uh, amazing. The second is innovate, innovating must be done in small steps. Now, you can always innovate very far, and innovation is crucial, of course, for survival. If you stay still, then you won't be able to move, right? So you got to be careful, though, because if not, in my experience, you have to ease the market into it, or you risk something called ISS. What is ISS? Innovate shots sendiri, <laughs> right? If for the outsiders, short sendiri means only you care about it, nobody else cares about it, right? You're, the, you're, only in, you know, you're innovating for yourself, which doesn't mean anything. So I'd like to show to you how we kind of demonstrate to you how we kind of innovate in the, in the experiences that have been through. If you take the demographic of Malaysia again, or the demographic of any society, you put it on its side against the y-axis of time, and we have a product there, if you are a maker of innovative product, you would actually think that the best place to put the product is at the orange triangle, and where, you know, amongst the innovators and early adopters. But in my experience, we actually best put it at the neck of it, at the neck where it's near the urban side and also near the mass market, because then the mass market would understand it. It's close to them. It's a bit far, but it's still close, and it's still, it's still close enough for the urban guys, so they'll be like, I can understand this. But what happens, though, the mass market will gravitate towards the product. So when they gravitate towards the product, they get closer to the urban guys. And the urban guys go like, wait a minute, these mass market guys are a bit too close to me. I'm going to move further and progress and find new stuff. So when that happens, there's a movement and the market moves. So your product, which was once urban, now becomes mass market, like our groups Too Fat, and Innuendo and ATV became mass market. So if you still want to stay innovative, you can now, of course, stay in the mass market and make money, but it will last a short while only. What you got to do is then move your product back to the new neck and then do the same thing again. Movement happens again, and basically society kind of progress if you keep moving your product into the new neck. Okay, so in this case then, we help society progress, help to move the collective brain, and it's no longer ISS for Innovate Short Study, but becomes uh, Innovate in Small Steps. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. So last thing is, again, it's not just your product. Point number three, very important. It's actually who you are. Now, I know you all will attend a lot of talks that say, you know, to survive in the digital world, you need to be flexible. Yeah, correct. You need to be adaptable. Correct. You need to be resilient. Yes, correct, because you will always fail, right? You will always need to be creative. But the last two is something that I like to say that people don't pay enough attention. Number one is you need to have balls, right? You need to have, be courageous. If you don't have, you know, if you're not courage, the, the top four doesn't mean anything. And the last one is you need to have gut instinct. And gut instinct is important because it, it kind of gives you the feeling that, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready, ready to jump. I'm going to jump because I know it's going to work. The only gut instinct can you get is when you hang out in the mosh pits. You go out there, out in the market, jump up and down with your consumers, then you understand. Don't, don't hire a research company to tell you exactly what you want them to tell you, right? You actually go out there and feel it for yourself. So that will make the difference between a great product and a hit innovative product that would change the collective brain, right? Most people here will do research, and then you get information, then you will get some insights from this research, will give you a great product. But if you add the last two, you add gut instinct and courage, you'll either get an exciting hit or an exciting miss. Either way, go up in you know, blazing flames or go up in blazing smoke. Either way, life's going to be fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Izam.